So uh, welcome again, everyone, for joining uh, the Vancouver City Planning Commission this evening for uh, the conversation about housing in Vancouver. Uh, my name is Robert Huang. Uh, I am a current Vancouver City Planning Commissioner. Uh, I am a uh, I'm Chinese Canadian, specifically uh, Southern Chinese by ancestry and by culture, but I'm Canadian by uh, for my day job. I work for Terra Housing, uh, who is sponsoring today's event. Uh, I'm a development manager with Terra Housing. Uh, I have the um, I have the great privilege of working with a very talented and dedicated uh, team. Uh, we support uh, numerous uh, passionate uh, nonprofit housing boards throughout the province in achieving um, local purpose real estate goals, uh, developing affordable housing. Uh, and so uh, today I'm honored to have uh, this moderator and panel combo here uh, with Lillian, Jennifer, Nathan, and Jens uh, here this evening for this discussion. Uh, but where I would like to start is um, to take the opportunity to acknowledge that uh, we are on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, uh, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh uh, nations. Um, we thank them for having cared for these lands and waters since time immemorial, and uh, look forward to working with uh, uh, the nations in partnership as we continue to build this great city together. Um, so, for folks that are attending that uh, don't know. Um, uh, this is uh, an event hosted by the Vancouver City Planning Commission. Uh, a bit about the Planning Commission, we're a body of volunteer citizens appointed by Vancouver City Council to advise on the future of the city. Uh, the mandate of the Planning Commission is to advise mayor and council on topics relating to the future of the city. And, and also on a broader level, uh, we have a role as conveners of dialogue. So uh, the VCPC uh, seeks to provide uh, and support space for thoughtful conversations about how our city is evolving and how we can shape this as a community. Um, these dialogues are intended to bring out ideas for what we need to pay attention to as we look to that future and to help us uh, make choices that guide uh, uh, ourselves towards a just, equitable, and inclusive uh, future city. Um, so just a bit of housekeeping, uh, people have kind of uh, dropped in. Uh, you might have seen that uh, tonight's event is being recorded. Uh, there'll be a video graphic recording along with transcripts uh, and a summary of the discussion will be posted on the VCPC website. Um, for those that are hard of hearing, um, the, today's event uh, will include closed captioning, uh, which may also be of use for uh, people that are non-native uh, English speakers. Uh, and following the conclusion of today's uh, uh, event, there will also be a written transcript. Um, so I'll also point out that uh, today, uh, our panelists will also be displaying a few uh, presentation slides, but due to Zoom's technical um, constraints, you may not see the speaker's screens with the slide at the same time. If you run into this uh, little uh, hiccup, uh, you'll want to look in the corner of your screen, find a little view button, and you'll be able to change to Zoom side-by-side -side sharing mode uh, under view options in the top right. So you'll have some options there in terms of how you take in presentation. Uh, if it works, you'll be able to see the speaker and their slide deck. Uh, if you need any help, uh, there's a chat box um, that you can click, uh, and you'll be able to message uh, any of our, you know, or house, but very important uh, house uh, event hosts uh, if you need any help with any of that. Um, we'll also be sh using the chat function to, <clears throat> excuse me, share links. Uh, we find it helpful to kind of not disrupt the flow of conversation from our panelists and our moderator um, as we go along. So if there's any kind of one-off questions or definitions, we'll be sure to try to cover it uh, there. Um, and then, uh, uh, finally, uh, there'll be a Q&A session. So after our moderator and panelists have, a have had a chance to present and speak, uh, we'll be using Zoom's Q&A function there to respond to questions. So please um, you know, uh, enter your questions there. Uh, any and all thoughtful questions are welcome. Uh, and if you have a question for any of our specific speakers and Lillian, uh, our moderator as well, please uh, type in at and then at Lillian, at Nathan, at Jennifer, at Yens, and we'll make sure we get your questions direct uh, to them. Um, and then uh, if you see your questions being asked, uh, 
you feel free to use the thumbs up function in the Q&A if there's a certain question you just want to, to, to upvote, as it were. Uh, and then um, just take us in the home stretch before I turn it away from me. Um, we ask uh, uh, as part of this session that um, you try to turn off any distractions that you might have going on. We you know, appreciate folks tending to be present during the discussion. Um, uh, we ask that you take care to, to not to assume uh, any person uh, pronouns or gender or anything like that based off of their video image or their names. Um, you're certainly welcome to refer to people by their usernames, of course. Uh, and then uh, make sure you um, uh, take, a, take care to take a step back that if you've already asked a question that you might consider taking a step back to allow others to be heard and not necessarily monopolize the conversation. Uh, and, and as always, uh, it's been a it's, it is a difficult summer and has been a difficult summer. So if you feel the need to get up, take a break, stretch your legs, take a personal moment, uh, please feel free to do that. Um, now, without further ado, uh, I'd just like to introduce our moderator this evening uh, and I'll turn it over. So uh, this evening, the commission has great pleasure to have Lillian Chow uh, as the event moderator. Uh, Lillian, I can say is a very passionate advocate of affordable housing. Uh, and uh, as part of her day job, she is the director of community real estate at Brightside Community Homes Foundation, where she's involved in the uh, development, <clears throat> excuse me, development and creation of equitable, inclusive, and healthy communities. Uh, prior to that, she uh, also uh, spent a lot of time uh, working for Van City, uh, working uh, in supporting the nonprofit community, uh, as well as coming up with uh, development strategies for. Uh, the creation of affordable rental housing for seniors, families, and people uh, with disabilities in Upper Vancouver. Uh, and uh, I, I think I should also point out that Lillian is part of uh, Suhamish Nation's uh, Nonprofit Housing Society's inaugural board, uh, Hiam Housing Society, uh, who uh, we're very excited um, uh, to see is uh, embarking on uh, the development of their kind of first round of affordable projects uh, on, on Suhamish. Uh, nation land. Um, Lillian, I'm sure I've missed something, so I'll turn over to you to, to, do, to do yourself justice. Thanks. Oh, well, thanks, thanks very much, Albert and Yuri and the Vancouver City Planning Commission. Uh, it's my pleasure to be moderating this evening, and I just want to say good evening to everybody. Um, thanks for joining us on this warm uh, and sunny uh, summer afternoon. Uh, to really talk about one of the most challenging issues that we have in the city, which is about housing. So I'm going to set this up a little bit with some introductions. I'll do our introductions of our panelists. And uh, we also want to get to know a little bit about who's in the room. So Yuri, if you don't mind, maybe we'll start with that first. Uh, and uh, do you mind pulling up the poll? And we're just asking folks to just let us know um, what is your professional or community background? Uh, and just kind of let us know and our panelists know who you are in the room. So we'll probably give folks about 15 seconds or so. Okay, Yuri, are we able to close the poll? Okay, so it looks like we've got quite a mix of residents, but also folks from the public and private um, sector and the nonprofit sector. So thanks for coming and uh, we welcome your questions as we uh, go along as well. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I am uh, coming to you usually in Vancouver, but right now I'm actually on the traditional and ceded territories of the Qualicum and Comox First Nations here on Vancouver Island. And I just want to respectfully acknowledge uh, where I am and recognize um, uh, their care for the land that we are on today. So welcome to this session. And, um, you know, one of the reasons why we are brought these three panels together is because, you know, City of Vancouver is currently reviewing their housing and demographic data to help inform future housing policy directions. And so we thought this would be a really interesting conversation to have with three data-driven panelists of Jens von Bergman, Jennifer May uh, Michael Bradshaw, and Nathan Louster. So to have them share their analysis on the big question that we're going to focus on tonight, is Vancouver building enough housing? 
So this is a very broad question and we would uh, love to hear the different perspectives and also uh, really hear from our three panelists and their background in data uh, and uh, looking at the analytics of housing and demographic data as well. So we're also gonna to touch on nonprofit and non-market housing as well as market housing. And there will also be opportunities for the audience to ask some questions towards the end. So we're gonna have about 45 minutes of discussions during this time. So um, I would like to introduce our panelists a little bit more this evening. I'm not gonna go through their full bios, but if you are interested, please go to the Eventbrite website. I think there's a little bit more information about each of them on there as well. So first I'd like to introduce Jens von Bergman, who is the president of Mount to Math, a Vancouver-based data analytics and visualization company. Jens takes a data-driven approach to Vancouver housing, planning, and demographics questions, and regularly addresses questions of public interest through data on his blog. Next, we have Jennifer Michael Bradshaw. She is a data analyst, housing activist, and a director of Abundant Housing Vancouver. She strongly believes in land back, that housing policy is climate policy, and in a just, equitable, and inclusive city. Last but not least, we, we have Nathan Louster, who is a UBC sociology professor, a blogger, and sometime demographer who primarily studies housing, home, households, and cities. He's also the award-winning author of The Death and Life of Single Family House, Lessons from Vancouver on Building a Livable City. So I, I'm sure most of you have probably seen our palace on social media. They're very active there. And we're just really happy um, for them to join us tonight to actually share their views and information. So to kick off our evening, we've asked each of our panelists to actually prepare a short presentation because we can't discuss data without PowerPoints, right? So we've asked them all to prepare a short PowerPoint. Uh, they'll each speak for about six, seven minutes or so. And um, we're gonna start first off with Jens, who's gonna kick us off with his presentation, answering this question about, is Vancouver building enough housing? Over to you, Jens. Thanks, Lillian. So um, let me share my screen and I'm also gonna drop off a link to the slides in the chat where um, that might be helpful for people. <clears throat> Okay. So, um, is Vancouver building enough housing and how will we know? Um, housing supply is um, a sort of broad term and I just wanna focus in on some aspects of it. Um, the overall quantity matters. Do we in the general region have enough um, supply for people to, to live, but also where is that supply? Do we, um, where, where do we put it? Um, broadly, when we talk about it, we have two types of housing. We have market housing and non-market housing. Um, each one of these, a housing unit is a housing unit, but we allocate them differently. Market housing usually gets allocated via money. So um, it's just a matter of how much people can pay. Non-market housing gets allocated usually via wait, wait lists or some other mechanisms um, that decides who gets to live there and who doesn't. Um, generally, it's hard to talk about housing and um, to fix some aspects of the housing crisis um, under the backdrop of an overall shortage. It's kind of a bit like whack-a-mole if, you, if you're trying to do this. And um, geographic misallocation of housing really accelerates exclusion, segregation in central areas and adds to commute pressure. So um, I also wanna talk about the link between housing, location and jobs. Um, there's a number of signals how we know if we have enough housing or not. Really the main signals for market housing is rents, home prices, vacancy rates, um, for non-market housing, we have wait lists, and I believe Nathan will um, spend a little more time um, looking at these things. We got secondary indicators. Um, the fact that we have such high land lift when we upzone, simply um, it, it's a direct measure of our scarcity, this, this kind of land lift. Uh, when FSR gets maxed out on every project um, and no developer ever says, well, I could build 16 stories, but I really only wanna build 12, 
um, because that's what I think works best for the site and is really all that's needed here. Um, that, that would be an indication that maybe we do have enough if that happens a lot. Um, if not, if everybody maxes out, then maybe we don't. Um, another part um, that can tell us about um, housing is really the link between housing and uh, the more general economy. So um, for example, in Vancouver, uh, in our economic region, lower mainland Southwest, we've had consistently um, high labor force participation, low unemployment, and high job vacancy rates. So it's, gonna, it's getting really hard to fill those jobs if there aren't enough places for people to move to. So if these pressures are too high, um, that is a drag on the overall economy. So you can think of this in terms of maybe the prices are too high, so people can move here or leave, or there just aren't enough spaces, so prices get bid up in the process, prices and rents. <clears throat> so to touch briefly on location, uh, we can look at um, where have we actually added people and where have we lost people over the last uh, maybe 10 or 20 years. And looking at it, we've seen that um, a lot of the growth has happened sort of in toward the Fraser Valley in Coquitlam and Surrey and the Langleys, if we look at Metro Vancouver. Um, and uh, we've lost um, population in some of the um, central parts, or lost commuters. I'm, I'm here really only looking at commuters to not, um, not get distracted by uh, seniors or children that, that aren't working just to look at that um, at, at commute patterns here. And on the west side in Vancouver, the same as West Vancouver district of North Vancouver, we've lost population over this time. Um, what does that mean for commuting? Um, if we're looking on the right graph, we see that in Surrey, uh, commuters that we've added predominantly drive. Whereas in the city of Vancouver, commuters that we've added on net predominantly don't drive, but take other modes of transport. And that has implications overall of how our region functions. So we can see this also just by looking at these commute flows of, um, this is a snapshot in 2016, um, from which municipality to which municipality do uh, people commute. And that gives us an idea about um, how um, the places where we, um, where we grow, where we build for people to live differs from where people work. And we see this uh, very clear trend of moving toward Vancouver, Burnaby and Richmond and um, away from the more outlying regions. So really, um, I like to think about cities as matchmakers. Um, why do we have cities in the first place? Why do people congregate? It's really because um, the proximity of people, jobs, and amenities creates synergies. And um, to build this sustainably, we really want to focus on these people being able to move around without being dependent on private motor vehicles. So here's a way of how we can look at where is opportunity to access those jobs. And here I only fo focus on jobs. Um, incidentally, that does in some ways coincide with amenities. The amenities in the city of Vancouver are also quite amazing. And it gives us a map of opportunity, which um, is something where we should probably think about when we want to, where we want to focus growth. What are key barriers? Uh, key barriers to a housing supply really is zoning. So this is from the uh, Metro Vancouver zoning project that uh, Nathan and I have done that looks at a unified zoning, unified zoning fabric, oops, sorry. Unified zoning fabric over all of Metro Vancouver. And we can see a lot of yellow um, low density housing zoning here that uh, disallows uh, housing that is denser than single family in the city of Vancouver, maybe with a laneway house and a suite or uh, duplexes. Um, the other part about zoning is how, how dense can we actually build housing there? And this just gives you an overview over um, what is actually allowed. So in most of um, single family and duplex land, we are at about a 0.6 to 0.75 um, FSR that conditionally can be a little bit higher for infill. 
Um, even in multifamily, um, most of our multifamily zoning is really only at around one FSR outright um, with some conditional zoning. So a lot of the zoning that we have, this is just for the city of Vancouver. A lot of the zoning we have is conditional that depends on the direct of planning, neighborhood input and um, other questions, whether things can be built or not. And um, in more dense housing, downtown areas, we, we allow significantly more. So to wrap this up, what kind of housing do we need? I say we need all kinds of housing. Housing is a system. So if we think of all new housing needed to be targeted to specific um, purposes, we will fail. Or to put it in the words of Michael Mandel, who is a planning professor at UCLA, if we believe that cheap housing matters and expensive housing doesn't, and we act on that belief, our primary accomplishment will be to make our cheap housing expensive. And I'll end it here. Thanks, Jens. Um, really appreciate you putting that together. And that sets up us well for um, continued conversation about this. So our next presenter is with Jennifer. So please share your screen with us. Hi, everyone. Uh, Jen, I'll be talking a little bit more about uh, this housing system that Jens uh, showed us briefly, and I'll talk a little bit more about what kind of housing this housing system is currently producing. So, what is the status quo of housing in Vancouver? According to BC assessment data, uh, we are currently building mostly low density housing. Um, and as you might expect, when most of our land is zoned for single detached houses, mostly only. So, Vancouver is already fully built out. So what this means is that old detached houses are being replaced with new, more expensive detached houses, which of course means zero net new housing is being created, yet there's plenty of gentrification. So what this does is it causes displacement of basement suite renters, for example, often permanently, since wealthier families living in these new expensive houses are less likely to need basement suite rental income to pay their mortgages. Now, when I show this graphic to people, I often get a surprised reaction. Um, people are actually often under the impression that we're building plenty of towers in the city. Um, and actually, this is a, a bit of a misconception. It's born of our planning. We currently restrict multifamily development, including you know, condo towers, rental of apartments, to arterials, to right beside arterials only. So people drive through arterials all the time and see these new highly visible developments. However, they miss the redevelopment of these detached houses that occurs in the majority of Vancouver's residential land um, off of arterials. It's less visible, right? So that's again where detached houses are becoming more expensive detached houses. Now I've alluded to this already a little bit, but now uh, let's look at who is actually living in these different types of houses. This is Metro Van household income data. Um, and as you might expect, um, both average and median incomes are highest for single detached houses. They're the most expensive types of housing generally. So the most, the wealthiest people live in them. Um, then it goes down to semi detached row houses, duplexes, et cetera. And then at the bottom here, you get apartments, right? So apartments are predominantly the housing form for lower income households. Again, this is another common misconception here that I'd like to highlight a bit. Mo most people, many think people think of new condos as luxury. And absolutely, some of them um, can be quite expensive. Um, I, I can't afford a condo myself. <laughs> but uh, however, it's definitely nowhere near as luxury as detached houses, particularly new detached houses. Uh, many condos get rented out. Um, they become rental housing stock. They house relatively lower income people, um, but yeah, in, in terms of uh, average incomes and immediate median incomes, detached houses equals wealthier people. This is um, quite important, I feel, to highlight because it's very regressive. This uh, here, I know it's a little bit hard to see, but this is our uh, development cost levy uh, table from the city of Vancouver. So despite, despite detached houses being the most expensive housing for the wealthiest people, the fees we charge for it are actually the lowest at about $45 per square meter. Meanwhile, mid and higher residential uh, rates per square meter are actually much higher. It's, it can range from uh, something like uh, 
$96, $97 to $194 um, for, higher, for a higher density residential. So it's a little bit like if uh, for every $100,000 I make over the average income threshold, I don't make that much, of course, I make about average income, but for that every additional $100,000, I actually pay the lower income tax rate. That's what, kind of what it's like. So it's the opposite of a progressive tax. It's kind of like the opposite of a luxury tax. It's very aggressive and it's highly inequitable. Oh, actually, I'm actually gonna go back real quick. I'll also note that the uh, DCLs for parking garages are a dollar versus for school use or community childcare use is higher, which also, again, is a little bit off, I think. So let's talk a little bit about why this matters. Of course, reg regressiveness, regressivity is bad in and of itself because you're basically discouraging lower end housing and encouraging higher end housing. You're hurting the poor while helping the rich, right? Um, yeah. However, it gets worse. So this is data that illustrates the energy use of households living in urban detached houses versus urban multifamily house homes. Um, and uh, so basically, uh, pretty easy to understand. More energy is spent on heating and cooling detached houses than multifamily homes. And more energy is spent on transportation while living in detached houses because work, groceries, amenities, everything is farther away. So more energy means more fossil fuel emissions. People living in big sprawling houses cause more emissions. These emissions cause a host of health problems. They are neurotoxic. Uh, they can cause an, and exacerbate respiratory problems like asthma. Um, yet, people living in these detached houses are largely protected from these negative externalities, these negative health problems. It's apartment dwellers that are that that ha that have to suffer these externalities because our housing, people like renters like me, are predominantly allowed to live only on arterials where emissions are highest. So. Apartment dwellers and public transit goers like me who don't cause that many emissions actually take most of the damage from all these emissions caused by people living in these bigger houses, driving bigger cars. I, I quote some, uh, some city public consultation uh, materials here and I've, I've, I've read that uh, these apartments are buffers for detached house owners. Um, we are literally considered kind of the human shields for noise and pollution caused predominantly by these wealthier house owners. Again, highly regressive, highly inequitable. So going back to the, the central question here, the answer uh, to my answer to the question of do we need more housing is yes. Uh, but I'd say we actually don't really need more detached luxury houses, uh, and we certainly shouldn't have the majority of city land reserved exclusively for them. What do we need? Well, we certainly need more homes by and for Indigenous people, especially since so many homeless people identify as Indigenous. They are vastly overrepresented in the homeless population, yet these are their lands. As uh, the Squamish Nation Councilor Halsland says, uh, it's absurd. They are homeless on their own land. Uh, we will especially, oops, sorry, we especially need more non-market homes as well. We absolutely need more secure housing for lower income people and the market will not serve the poorest of us. So we need specialized housing with supports for some. Nonprofits and BC housing have huge wait lists for social housing and it's really unacceptable. We also absolutely need more multifamily homes off of arterials. We truly cannot have renters continue to be pollution buffers for the lucky, wealthy, polluting few that can afford the big, expensive, detached houses on the leafy, quiet, neighborhood character side streets. So we really need more spatial equity. And as Jens said earlier, uh, we cannot solve housing insecurity while homes are scarce. Landlords have too much power to choose tenants in conditions of scarcity of low rental vacancies, and there really must be plentiful housing options so tenants can choose and avoid bad landlords. Um, I'm gonna try and quickly do this. We also must be prepared to welcome climate refugees. So I talked a little bit about how our emissions are regressive, but we also should talk about how our first world emissions is affecting the rest of the world. Anthropogenic climate change is causing catastrophe in developing countries and here, but also definitely in developing countries. The glaciers are, are dwindling. Um, the Himalayas regions in particular are experiencing droughts, water and food insecurity. There's ecological breakdown and there's already millions internally displaced and millions more are coming. The developing world largely caused this. We must take responsibility and help save lives being threatened by climate breakdown in the future. So we must have homes for them. So 
looking forward a little bit, uh, I want to talk about, a little bit about this as well. Um, I'm banning apartments. Um, Jens also talked about this a little bit, but we certainly have to, um, we need to unban apartments, not just on the arterials, but we have to allow them on quiet side streets, ideally near rapid transit, so that we can transition away from, you know, uh, driving and, and too much and too much driving. Um, we really need all this public infrastructure to go towards people like people who are renters, and not just to detached house owners. All this pink here is are all detached houses. Only detached houses are allowed to be built. This is a, a, a one kilometer walk shed. Um, near uh, SkyTrain stations. And so much of this land is still exclusively reserved for detached houses. And all these houses are, are getting all of the, you know, the land value benefits, the public uh, transit access. Um, really, we could have so many more people get access to these SkyTrains if we replaced these with apartments. And when we replace detached houses with apartments, instead of trying to um, just replace the existing apartments and arterials, we have much less of displacement as well of, ex of existing renters. So I'd like to little, end on a slightly less ominous note. This is probably my most hopeful slide here. Uh, so Sinak and Land Back. So Sinak is a Squamish Nation reserve. It's not bound by colonial government's regressive housing system. They're building lots of much needed purpose-built secure rental buildings, and those will generate much needed revenue for their nation members. So in my eyes, this is, this is, this is wonderful. We should be absolutely returning more land to the MST nations, um, and this is a reconciliation priority. I think we need a lot more of this. That's it for me. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and that's a great slide to uh, end with as well and bring that uh, commentary on Indigenous lands, because uh, we fully recognize that that's where we are developing and, and living on. Um, so now we'd like to invite Nathan to share his screen and uh, to share his perspective on this question. Is Vancouver building enough housing? Thanks, and uh, uh, thanks for um, having me here. I'm actually excited to be a part of this panel. Um, so yes, in terms of addressing this question, um, make sure I'm actually... There we go. Uh, I started by thinking about uh, what are we talking about in terms of building enough housing for what? Um, obviously, we are a city. We have a whole mess of different views on what um, should be our goals effectively as a city. Um, so I wanted to lay out some of the different goals that we might have as a city. And that's an appropriate context from my perspective for then addressing this question, are we building enough housing? Um, to start with, uh, I, I really ground myself in terms of trying to figure out our human rights obligations. Um, and I think if we're looking at our human rights obligations, especially with respect to the right to housing, but also with respect to other rights, like the freedom of movement and freedom of association, um, I do not think we are uh, building enough housing. Uh, the same is true in general, and this is connected to uh, whether or not we're building enough housing to keep down rents and prices. No, we're not. Uh, to support economy and job growth, as Jens laid out, we're not doing that either. Uh, to meaningfully reduce our per capita greenhouse gas emissions, as Jennifer pointed out, we're not doing that either in terms of building enough housing for that. Uh, to support and grow a vibrant urbanism, nope, not quite. On the other hand, uh, I think there are a number of different perspectives that say, yes, we're building enough housing. As a matter of fact, we're building too much. Uh, in general, I think those tend to be uh, from the perspective of um, small C conservative preventing neighborhood change, um, retaining character, which of course is rooted uh, in terms of our specific character retention policies and a particular settler colonial vision of what kind of character we want to preserve, uh, to enable drivers to easily park anywhere. And of course, these are many of the comments that we get in terms of objections to uh, more construction. Um, to maximize landlord and neighbor choosiness, the ability to choose your tenant or to choose your neighbor, um, that's all benefited by not building very much in terms of not giving very many options to people in, uh, in terms of where they could become a tenant or a neighbor. Uh, and then finally, to ensure real estate and financial investment return. And we know that uh, we are building too much uh, to ensure uh, real estate financial investment return once we actually stop getting REIT and other sort of financial investors really investing heavily in a region. They're investing heavily in purchasing uh, apartments in regions and uh, single family houses most recently in regions when they think 
there's not going to be enough construction in that region to support growth. That's what earns them profits. They're very clear about that in their statements. So effectively, in terms of the rest of my particular presentation, I'm going to be focusing on um, this earlier set of, of reasons that I don't think we're building enough. And I think for me, they all come together in terms of we're not building enough to be an inclusive city. A nice sort of framework for thinking about this and thinking about how much we're building and how the housing system in general works is thinking about housing as musical chairs. Uh, a number of people have, have walked through this as a nice illustration of the housing system as well. Jenny Schutz is one um, who, who I'm borrowing this metaphor from. But uh, we can think about, uh, it's not, in terms of thinking about musical chairs, the idea is you've got uh, sort of these chairs set up, you're moving around them in a circle, and the music plays, and then when the music stops, um, whoever doesn't get to sit in a chair is cast out of the game. That's the general uh, theory behind musical chairs. In terms of how this works as a housing system, and we can think of this as a metaphor for the housing system, we know that not everyone is playing musical chairs every year. But every year, about 13% of Canadians do move. Effectively, they hear the music and they make some sort of a move. Mostly they're moving for choice. They, they're trying to move to a better place to live. They're trying to move to a bigger apartment because their family has grown. Um, they're trying to move because of a domestic breakdown in some cases that they need to get out of where they're currently living. Or they're trying to move for jobs, um, trying to move for a nice retirement location, et cetera. Of course, some of these moves are also forced moves, which I'll come back to. As people move, they look for newly opened chairs, and their old chairs often open up, especially if they're all moving together as a household. And then when the music stops and chairs are more scarce than players, those who move the fastest or who have the most money to spend get the chairs. That's in general how our housing system works. An inclusive city means we have chairs for anyone who wants one, and that's what I think we should be moving for. Now, part of trying to figure out how many chairs we need to get chairs for anyone who wants one um, is figuring out how many players there are. And quite honestly, we just don't know. In part, that's because a lot of the players who might be interested in a chair here in Vancouver aren't actually here yet. So we just don't know how many people are playing in terms of trying to get a place to live in Vancouver. But we do know that the players who are playing are moving around very fast and spending a lot more money on chairs than they used to in the past. And this suggests to us that we have way fewer chairs than players. And so that's where we get this sense that we need to build more. Uh, in terms of adding net new units, this is how we actually add new chairs, right? We need to add net new units, um, places for people to live. In this sense, both the rickety milk schools, which I uh, demonstrated here, and these really beautiful shiatsu full body massage chairs, any kind of housing that we're adding is net housing is really gonna help, right? It's still gonna be the case that the fastest players are going to move to those shiatsu massage chairs as soon as they become available. But as long as they're opening up other sorts of housing for other people to live in, as long as we're adding lots more of this housing, then we will eventually be able to find everybody a place to sit. That's what we're moving for. At the same time, it's also the case that uh, we're not going to get um, uh, markets to build fancy chairs for everybody. Uh, and we need to actually make sure we're also building and reserving a lot of chairs for people who aren't going to be able to um, effectively run this race and get a chair um, just using markets. So that's where we're going to have a lot of non-market housing that's going to be filling these gaps for us. Coming back to some of these general points, are we building enough to be an inclusive city? Right? No. We do know, though, and we have very, very good data, that the more housing we put out there, the more it helps reduce prices and rents. We can see this both in terms of MLS listings, um, how many places are there available for sale? The more of them that, as they rise, as the listings rise, um, the prices come down. It's a very clear relationship. The same is true on the rental side, as Jens already showed. The more places that you have available for rent, the more the rents come down. Right? So the vacancy rate is also very predictive of rentals. So we add more chairs to reduce prices and rents. Are we reserving enough housing uh, to actually promote the right to house? In particular, are we reserving enough housing for people um, to live in outside of this market context? People who cannot um, actually compete with all the intense competition for chairs within the market. We know we're not reserving enough. We know we're not reserving enough for the housing seekers who are already here in Vancouver. 
We know this through a whole variety of different metrics. One of these, of course, is the poor housing need metric that we get from uh, CMHC itself and from Statistics Canada. Uh, I've got the, the housing metric here in terms of BC as a whole, but we can see the city of Vancouver portion there at the top in the light green, the metro of Vancouver portion of the dark green. We have about 50,000 people living in core housing need within the city of Vancouver, and it expands much broader to, to the rest of uh, metro Vancouver as well. Then we can see what the actual BC housing portfolio is. It's much, much smaller than the actual core housing need, right? So in terms of the different housing units that BC housing has available, in terms of the households, they also help through rent assistance. They're not housing enough people to actually bring down that core housing need. Uh, even with the expansions, and it's great that BC housing is planning more expansions of the, of the housing stock. It's great to see those investments being put together. Uh, that's still not going to come near to addressing that core housing need. And we also see from the housing waitlist data that we have, uh, it's really difficult to find this data. This data is coming from the Canada Housing Survey from 2018, asking people themselves if they're on a waitlist. Uh, here we've got a sense that about uh, uh, half of those 25,000 people or so that are on waitlists have been on for over two years. The other half are, have been on for two years or less but you get a sense that people are waiting on these wait lists for a long, long time to get social housing. Again, we don't have enough of it. And then of course, most directly, we can see that in the homeless count uh, where it's most clear. Um, we've seen this gradual rise in homeless, both in Metro Vancouver and in the city of Vancouver. Do the chairs we add actually get sat upon? This has become a big issue in, in Vancouver, right? We have a lot of people who have been concerned that we've got empty apartments. And so we add a whole bunch of chairs and nobody's actually uh, living in them or sitting on them. But we now have a lot of data to come back to this. And it's very clear at this point with the data that we have from the empty homes tax and the vacancy tax uh, that indeed these chairs are being sat upon, right? We definitely have people living in here. It's about 1% or less of uh, properties that appear to be empty. And if you want to look at the exemptions, we've got lots of data as well in terms of what kinds of exemptions we're offering to people, but there's not that many taking them. In general, we build things, people sit on. Finally, just to come back to uh, this freedom to move, we do know that the scarcity of chairs can really lead to uh, a lot more forced movements, especially in situations where landlords um, um, are empowered to actually evict people. Recent reforms in BC seem to have done a lot to actually reduce these forced moves and the risk of being a for, having a forced move as a renter, which is great. So that just came in in 2018 and the NDP government shut down some of these loopholes and they're still working on fixing some of our uh, rental tenancy agreements. But um, at the same time, we know we have a long way to go to actually enable more people to move for choice, to actually find places that better fit them as a household. We're not moving as much as we would like to see in terms of people being able to find the places they want to live and move there. And we see that here in Vancouver. So what's preventing adding more chairs? Mostly municipal policies and zoning. Uh, of course, I'm replicating Jens' slide here because we both have worked on this project and spent way too much time on it to not put that slide out every time we get the chance. So uh, here we see again the zoning pattern where we see uh, we're, we're really constraining the construction of more housing. On the other hand, we're also, and this works together with the zoning restrictions, insufficiently funding and scaling up our social housing. And I think we can do a lot more to scale up social housing. If you look back historically, one way we can help pay for this would be to raise up our property taxes. We could have built so much more social housing with our property taxes if we went back to the property tax rates that we had back in 2002. So in terms of uh, um, my final comment, just to bring us back to housing as musical chairs, uh, this very simple metaphor, all net additional chairs are gonna help us become a more inclusive city. We can and should fit a lot more chairs in Vancouver. We've got lots of room to do it. Um, fancy chairs can help, but diversity is really good. Uh, beware mandating massage chairs and outlawing milking stools. If it limits chairs overall, we need a lot more chairs. And adding reserve chairs in terms of social housing works best alongside adding more market chairs to build this inclusive city that I certainly want to see us move toward. That's it for me. Thanks.
sorry, having trouble getting that unmute button there. Uh, thank you so much, Nathan. Um, and actually, that's a great way to segue into um, some of the questions that we have prepared for our panelists. And as you've mentioned and others mentioned, we need uh, all sorts of different types of housing, including non-market housing and market housing. And, um, and you use the great analogy of the different types of chairs. So one of the questions that we have for the panelists and, um, is about, you know, how are we going to be building more non-market housing in the city? What is it going to take to create more of that non-market housing or the, the, the reserved chairs that uh, Nathan talked about? And Jennifer, I was wondering if we can start with you first on this question. Yeah, certainly. So I will say that I'm not a nonprofit developer and probably you would be a lot better at uh, answering this question actually, but I'll do my best. So uh, there's a couple uh, pieces that need to fall into place um, that for, for non-market housing to be uh, to actually be constructed um, that I've heard. Uh, so basically those four pieces mainly are um, financing. So uh, generally nonprofits will take out a mortgage to uh, build a new building um, that includes uh, that social housing and that though that financing um, can come from sources like CMHC, uh, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, um, and those can have lower interest rates and that could definitely help to keep rents low. Um, another piece that is usually required is something like uh, free land or, or public land being provided to that nonprofit or seed money, one or the other, or both, ideally. Again, um, the more that is provided upfront means a smaller mortgage and the rents can be relatively lower. Um, the, the free land, the public land, can be provided by the city, by the province, by the feds. Generally, I, 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 that I've heard uh, in the city of Vancouver lately, it is mostly the city, um, but all levels of government could. Uh, uh, hand over the existing public lands that they own, or they could purchase uh, public, uh, private lands and then um, give it over to his, a, a nonprofit housing provider. Another piece, uh, again, uh, Nathan and Jens has talked about this quite a bit as well, but the regulatory obstacles of zoning, of design review, of all of these public hearings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are so many um, regulatory hurdles that the city uh, erects and all the, the the, the barriers to apartments, to market housing, also exist for nonprofit housing. Nonprofit housing doesn't get a social housing doesn't get a pass for any of these things. So all of that, as costs, delays, um, it's, it's, it makes it more difficult. It adds risk, um, and that that causes issues as well. Um, the last part, portion, I believe, is something like institutional sustainability and growth of nonprofit housing providers themselves. So I believe they're, they, they're only about 10% or even less of the actual housing providers of, of the city of Vancouver compared to the market um, housing providers. So they're a relatively small force. And the issue with any sort of risk to their project. So if a one of their projects is, is not approved, for example, that can be a serious blow to a nonprofit. Um, I have some, I've, in my lived experience, I've seen a couple of my friends being laid off um, from a nonprofit housing provider after one of their proposals did, got rejected in the district of North Vancouver. I think Lillian knows exactly what I'm talking about here. I was devastated by that. The district of North Vancouver absolutely failed in its responsibility um, to prioritize nonprofit, nonprofit community land trust housing. So that is a, a serious risk, I think, to um, the capacity of nonprofit housing providers to actually be able to build uh, nonprofit housing. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, and I'd like to follow up on that piece on kind of the policy pieces and what the city can do that you've already touched on a bit already, Jennifer, and Nathan talked about, about you know, potentially increasing property taxes. That's one way to pay for affordable housing. Um, Jens, I'd like to just um, ask you the question, do you, what other kind of policies um, and things do you see the city can do or put in place or maybe not put in place that could encourage more affordable housing as well? Yeah, right. So um, I think the biggest issue, of course, with, with non-market housing is to find the land and to find the financing to, to make it work. So um, when it comes to land, so and, and generally there's been this punting of responsibilities back and forth by the city to the province and the feds and, and back down on who, uh, who provides what, which, which really is not that helpful. Um, I do um, want to second Nathan's um, concern here about property taxes. Um, the way how um, when property taxes um, in, in Vancouver, they're tied to simply the, the budget that we have. If assessments go up, 
and the budget stays roughly the same or only goes up very slowly, the property tax rate falls. Um, there's a number of um, um, issues that um, low property taxes can cause, especially in low interest environment and in market housing. But it's also a way really that signals to us that housing is getting out of reach for ordinary citizens. So putting a floor on the property tax rate and taking that difference to reinvest in non-market housing would be a really simple way that a sort of a, a, a feedback loop that's positive that helps us to, to provide funds when we most need it. And I think that's a, that's a great way for the city to step in and, uh, and increase its responsibilities and also responsiveness to the, the growing pressures. Thanks, Jens. Um, Nathan, do you want to add any more to this or should I ask you the next question, which you guys know about already? Uh, I, next question is fine, I'll say ditto. Okay. So I'll, I'm gonna go to you for the next question. Um, so we just talked a little bit about the non-market housing. Um, so we're gonna talk about more about market housing and uh, you have uh, provided that in, you know, actually all the panels have mentioned that in, the, in your presentations as well. So some, same question, you know, what's gonna take to actually build more market housing in the city? And uh, yeah, interested in your thoughts, Nathan. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. Um, one of the things that I think would be an interesting model is looking at New Zealand, which um, New Zealand is a similar size jurisdiction to what we are here in BC. Um, and they recently just uh, put in place a new urban policy statement, which really effectively constrained municipalities, but also empowered them in a different way. Um, so it effectively said that municipalities need to take seriously these housing needs assessments and um, respond to the shortages within their cities um, and enable plenty of room to grow in terms of these housing needs. And then they need to plan for it. And if they plan for it appropriately, they can also apply for infrastructure funds from the, pro from the uh, country, which is great. Right? Um, so there's carrots and sticks here. And if they don't plan for it approach appropriately, then effectively um, they can lose some of their powers. And for that matter, the New Zealand government is already effectively stripping away some powers from cities. One of these is parking minimums, saying you can't impose parking minimums anymore um, at all, uh, except for accessibility concerns. And, and that's great, right? And then the other, uh, big thing that they've done is said you cannot cap buildings at below six stories in height near um, the downtown areas, uh, major urban centers, and near major transit investments. And of course, transit investments are also big funding sources that are, that are national, not just, not just city specific. So I think that's a great model in terms of thinking about how we can take municipalities and reform them effectively and reform their powers. Right now, municipalities have these powers um, which limit their taxation ability, limit their ability to do what we're saying in terms of actually take those property taxes and invest them in social housing, um, but really encourage municipalities via the powers they've been given to be as miserly with their land as possible and, uh, and to really reduce uh, investment in housing. And that's something that I think should be reformed. So that's one model to do that is look to New Zealand. Thanks, Nathan. That's a... Yeah, that's a really interesting model. I mean, there's a number of municipalities um, in Canada that's actually reduced their their parking and and, and reparking requirements. And the city of Edmonton comes to mind uh, on that. And I think there's definitely some uh, you know other places in Canada that we can look to to uh, find some of these great examples because parking really is it's a very expensive um, um, piece that you have to do in your developments. And if you reduce that parking cost, that definitely can go a long way to creating more housing, but also affordable housing as well. So, uh, Jens, I'm wondering if or we, I can go to you for this question, uh, cause you did talk a little bit about, you know, you, we need both of these types of housing. So what are your thoughts and what will it take to uh, build more market housing in, in, in Vancouver? Building market housing is, is relatively easy compared to non-market housing. Um, really all that needs to happen, it, you need to allow it um, for it to get built. Um, so this is um, in, in Vancouver, generally a fairly lengthy process. Um, we don't really add housing in, under outright zoning. So any new multifamily housing that gets built in the city gets built either through a rezoning or a conditional um, 
that um, some of these conditionals can be useful. We've just had a, um, for example, a conditional zoning on non-market housing actually, but to allow outright non-market housing has much higher densities, uh, which is, is a great way to do it. And the uh, criteria for it are fairly clearly set, which makes it predictable and, and easy. So making things more predictable and allowing it is great. How can this happen? Uh, Nathan talked a little bit about the New Zealand model. California has a slightly different model that they have where they focus on um, basically frequent transit zoning. So they simply say that um, if you're close to the frequent transit network, you also have to come up with housing needs support, but it's also focused on, on the frequent transit network and you have to demonstrate that you're, you're trying to build housing in a way that is sustainably regionally. And um, if you can't, um, then the state might step in and take some of those zoning powers away from you. Um, yeah, and that's a very interesting, I mean, it's a totally, in some ways, a different governance culture, I would say. I mean, we have a pretty clear distinction between federal and provincial power. So that will be quite interesting. Uh, and the provincial to municipal powers, that'd be quite interesting to see where that plays out um, and where the maybe more cooperation or collaboration could occur between the different levels of government. Um, I'm actually um, looking through some of the, um, the questions that we have from the audience. I thought maybe I'll just ask this one to the panel because it follows nicely with um, what we're talking about right now. So the question is from uh, Baldwin Hum. Uh, in your opinion, does our current land zoning system broadly help or hinder us in building housing in the communities that we need? I'm wondering, Jennifer, if I can go to you on this one. Because you did touch upon that a little bit in your presentation as well. Sorry, would you mind repeating the question one more time? It cut out just a little bit for me. Yes. Um, so one question, in your opinion, does our current land zoning system broadly help or hinder us in building housing in the communities that we need? I would say definitely mostly hinders us. Uh, there are some good things about zoning and uh, things like um, making sure that we don't have very, very polluting industries right next to our to all of our housing, for example. <laughs> Although it's ironic, of course, that like I said, we do mandate um, all of our apartments to be right next to arterials, which are also very polluting. So um, I would say that zoning is inconsistent. It discourages housing to be mixed. So what happens with zoning currently is that we have these these C's, these yellow C's that you saw from Nathan and Jens, where these only these expensive detached houses are allowed to be built. And then you have some narrow strips or narrow pockets of land, small pockets of land where more um, apartments are allowed to be built. And what happens is we have a very clear segregation. And this was on purpose. <laughs> um, zoning was created to enforce segregation. So when Jim Crow laws were repealed in the US and, and, and anti-Black laws started to be actually be um, repealed, people in power, white people in power mostly, we tried to maintain that segregation by creating zoning. We, they saw basically that poorer racialized communities all lived in apartments and tenements and that wealthier white people lived in single detached houses and to maintain that and to further actually exacerbate that segregation, they created zoning. That absolutely has created, especially in the US, but also here, we see racialized communities, Chinatown, for example, um, being relatively high density, relatively low income, and then Shaughnessy, West Point Gray, uh, Southlands, tons and tons of these very, very wealthy detached neighborhoods, again, relatively more white. Um, and so this is, yeah, this, this is the history of zoning. And it's, it's kind of the elephant in the room. Um, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't shy away from the frankly awful racist, um, white supremacist history. So we need to promote a better social mix, more mixing of, 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 of white and racialized people and rich and poor. And we need to um, make sure that, the op that our children have these opportunities that they didn't have when you don't have social mixing. You don't want poor kids not being segregated away from rich kids and, and neither really understanding the experiences of the other and certainly poorer kids not having the opportunities that wealthier kids can enjoy. Thanks, Jennifer. I appreciate that, that answer. And certainly um, as a planner myself, it is uh, going to planning school, this is certainly not talked about, you know, the roots of planning and really the colonial um, and um, oppressive nature of where that these regulations actually come from. 
And I think hopefully we recognize that now, and there's still, I think, a lot of work to be done to actually, you know, reinvent zoning to a way that it can actually serve communities, like Nathan had mentioned in his um, in his presentation about having a more inclusive city. Um, on on this note, um, I was thinking we could ask a little bit about um, well, you know, given that there seems to be a um, reservation for, I guess, single family detached homes, uh, and there's a bias towards those and uh, a bias against kind of higher density living. Historically, we, we do seem to still see that bias play out in different public hearings uh, that we have right now, not just for non-market housing, but certainly for any sort of, you know, anything beyond a three or you know, four story building. So why do you think there is this opposition to building more housing, I would say probably denser housing um, in the city. And why, why do you think that is existing? And uh, you know, can you enlighten us a little bit with uh, some of the analysis that you guys have done or observations that you have made? And I'm wondering if we can ask Jens uh, to start on this question. I'll, uh, I'll give it a start. Um, Nathan is really the, uh, the single family home person and has uh, looked extensively at, at how people do this. So um, to preface, um, I grew up in Europe, in Germany, and um, there we don't have zoning that separates single family from multifamily the way we have here. So you can basically always build a three-story apartment building. Um, so so these, these clear restrictions don't exist. And um, so uh, coming here, I had a very hard time to actually understand um, how people are so focused uh, emotionally, culturally on this single detached home. Um, so I've seen it through my friends and I've uh, seen it through Nathan's book, but it's something that, that really has taken me some time to start to appreciate. And um, the way how our people um, view success in life through the form of the housing they live in. Um, and I think it can create real anxieties um, to um, say that, hey, um, maybe we'll take some single family homes and we convert them to multifamily. We're built out in Vancouver, really. There aren't many ways how we can grow. Either we um, go really tall in the few remaining uh, brownfields, some industrial um, areas, or we start to uh, reappropriate some of the low density housing um, and, and move there. And that is threatening. If your dream is to live in a single family home, then I can see how that, that is something that maybe is, is difficult, but um, we are growing. The number of single family homes can grow. It, it can only decline and uh, something needs to give. Thanks, Jens. And uh, let's go to Nathan then, obviously um, with his book, which someone asked uh, about um, and maybe uh, Albert and Yuri can just type that in the forum for, but uh, Nathan, love to hear your thoughts on this. Sure. Um, and uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think uh, Jens hit a lot of it. I think there is a sort of anxiety over this changing lifestyle um, in terms of especially, uh, you know, in North America, a lot of people imagine that they're going to be ending up in a, in a detached house. And that's just not um, something we have any more room for, certainly in the city of Vancouver. Um, but at the same time, I do think it's really important to note that overall, we're not opposed to denser forms of housing. We have really good polling on this. And across the city of Vancouver, definitely, um, people are in support of densification. And, and they're certainly in support of up to six stories. They're, they've expressed supports uh, uh, for even higher than that um, in terms of the majority of people within the city. So it's definitely something that, that the public is broadly in support of, of, of this process of densification. Municipal processes tend to reinforce the opinions of a real minority of people, though, who are very strongly opposed. And often, of course, they're the neighbors who would be uh, um, directly opposed to new housing showing up in the neighborhood. But there's also certain neighborhood associations that may not actually represent very many people in the neighborhood, but really represent the people who are opposed to new housing. Um, and those voices tend to have a really disproportionate impact on how our city and municipal politics work. So that's something we see, again, pretty good research on now that's not just a Vancouver problem, it's really across North America, the way our municipalities, our municipal processes, and our municipal political system 
are set up really reinforces this anti-housing bias, but it's not shared across the populace as a whole. Uh, so it's really about making sure that we get a better representation of those voices that aren't heard in current municipal processes. That's gonna get us a much greater acceptance and a much greater recognition of the real acceptance for density in our cities. No, that's a great point. And Jennifer, I like you, um, if you can comment on this as well as, as Nathan mentioned, you know, the system is actually creating the bias and, and creating the impression that there is such opposition. And you as a housing activist, you know, being in the trenches and attending these hearings, working to generate support, I'm curious to know your thoughts on, you know, what would it, what would that system change look like um, to kind of deal with this kind of bias? What would you like to see in this kind of municipal process when we're going through uh, you know, public hearings and different things for um, uh, for different housing developments. Yeah, so I am cringing as I, as I remember the many instances of, I mostly can only have time to go to social housing or non-market um, development uh, hearings. Occasionally we'll go to market ones, but honestly I hear very similar things in both. And it's all my property values. Um, a lot of the time traffic shadows um, these are the, the major concerns of these property owners that um, sur surround this development. And that's, that's really what the only people that the city really goes out and asks during this, uh, these consultation processes, they have a, a, a mandate. They are supposed to go and contact only the people around a development who are most likely, of course, to oppose it. It might affect their views. It might affect the traffic. Generally, it doesn't actually, but they will still complain about the potential, the risk of loss of their property values. And it's understandable to a certain extent, it's very privileged, but it's understandable that it is most likely the primary investment. It is what they are, are uh, most likely planning on retiring on. It is a multi-million dollar piece of land most likely that they own. And so I do understand, although I have a difficulty empathizing because I am a renter and they are often saying things like, renters are shouldn't be here they don't deserve to be here they are transitory they're migrant they are not they, they don't deserve to be here is what i hear all the time um what will it take honestly i think that we need to stop privileging these voices that are comfortably housed and and relatively usually very wealthy oftentimes are, are older are whiter um, and have access and easy access to power in city hall they're used to or able to figure out how to get to these places versus people who are renters who are younger who are busier who don't have this time who have who, who face structural barriers to participating especially at the city hall level and remember i mean it was only until i think the, the, the 70s until the 70s renters couldn't even vote municipally so municipal city hall fundamentally has a history of privileging property owners. This is a very long history of only um, enfranchising property owners. So this is nothing new. <laughs> this is a long history that we are currently battling against. Um, it's an uphill battle to try and get voices that are um, that represent more of the broad majority really like Nathan alluded to. Thanks Jennifer. Um, yeah, this is a, it's a tricky part with anybody going through a development. And I think Nathan, you're right from the four public hearings that uh, for our projects that we've done in the last 12 months, uh, we've received a lot more support um, than opposition. And that was really nice to see that people are welcoming uh, folks that aren't here yet, right? That's, I think that's a challenge when people aren't here yet, aren't being able to voice. And often at a public hearing, you're asked, where do you live? And it's weighted more if you already lived in the city rather than if you lived elsewhere. So I think that's something food for thought, I think for, for council and others that are doing public engagement and consultation to consider where that bias is coming in and how is that influencing decisions that are being made. Um, one, uh, so it's about 6.42 right now. Um, I think um, I'm gonna ask each of the, I'm gonna ask a couple more questions. I'm gonna try to um, pull from the Q&A here. And, and thanks everyone for submitting questions. Unfortunately, we're not able to answer all of them, but hopefully through some of these larger questions, we've bundled up some of these similar ones uh, for you. Um, one question here, um, Jens, we've talked about this when we were doing our prep that um, there, the province uh, convened an expert panel uh, on their final report. And there was a number of different recommendations that were made there. I know city council, there's a councilor motion tomorrow to ask city staff to actually uh, uh, look at 
um, you know, what they can do from these recommendations from uh, this expert panel report. I'm just kind of curious, um, Jens, what your thoughts are on how um, the city should take some of these recommendations or what some of the things that they could possibly action uh, out of uh, this report. Right. So, I mean, the, the report really aimed, uh, had recommendations for all levels of government, from the federal government to the province to also the municipality. And um, the, the key areas for, for the municipality to act um, in this space is really through zoning, through enabling more housing, through providing clarity in, in this process. And, um, and that's really something I think that the city needs to, needs to think about. Um, is our current process, the way how we grow, is that good moving forward, right? So fundamentally, um, how does housing actually get supplied, right? So if nobody wants housing, developers typically don't actually build it. So if you um, ask people to add a lot of housing to Detroit right now or to Cleveland, it's probably not going to happen because um, people will not want it. Maybe people want different type of housing. They want nicer housing, possibly. So some housing will get built, but it's it's not really going to be a net add because probably something will get torn down that uh, or uh, demolished or the city shrinks. So um, but when you have this process where um, developers add housing, here in the city, we don't enable this. So it's not a process where a developer can say, hey, I want to add housing. I have a parcel here. I know what I can build. I'm going to build it. Everything goes through this process, which is at least a conditional zoning, if not a rezone that we go through. So everything gets either spot zoned or conditionally zoned for specific projects. So the response that we're getting is really, really slow to increasing prices. Usually we'd expect to see much more housing to get built than it does here. And so that's, I think, a key aspect where the municipalities, the municipal level needs to step up and figure out how we do this. It's not saying get rid of all zoning. It's just saying, how can we do this in a way where we plan forward? What's the vision of Vancouver that we want in maybe 30, 50, 100 years, at least half the life cycle of a building? Does that building still make sense? Does the zoning still make sense? But I don't think we're thinking about it this way as a municipality. Uh, Nathan or Jennifer, um, would you like to make any comments on that question from the uh, expert panel report? Jennifer? Yeah, I'd love to. So um, there are a couple of things that really stood out, me to, out to me with the, the expert panel. They called for a more equitable treatment of renters and homeowners. This is something I'm talking about all the time. And actually, the, the expert panel did, uh, did make time to talk to me as well in, in their consultation rounds. And uh, especially at the provincial level and the federal level, we have so so many homeowner grants, uh, primary residence capital gains tax exemption. Um, there are so many ways uh, that homeowners are privileged over renters. Uh, there are also lots of other things like, um, I think you can get your uh, a hot water tank or something replaced, AC units replaced by, by heat pumps. There's just so many ways that people with already currently wealthier people have lots of grants and things that will help them improve their lives. And yes, it might improve things like climate um, emissions targets and things like that as well, but it is fundamentally inequitable because most renters don't have access to these um, to these benefits. And again, as we saw, renters um, and people living in multifamily apartments are relatively poor. And so there are some major problems here. The homeowner grant in particular, every single year, they keep on almost every single year, they, the gov this government has already raised that, that cap. So uh, the homeowner grant only applies to homeowners um, with a certain amount of property values, but that that um, maximum, the, the ceiling on that, they keep on raising every single year. They should not do that. Um, they should just say, okay, if you if you have a million dollars, that's enough. You don't need you don't need, you don't need a homeowner grant anymore. They don't do that. They keep on raising it every single year. Um, meanwhile, they don't actually have things like safer or the um, shelter rate for um, for 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 um, uh, social assistance. They don't have. They don't keep on raising those. So they index. They're basically indexing to inflation these homeowner grants, while they don't index to inflation these supports for lower income renters and people who are just lower income in general. So I, I find that extremely inequitable, and 
it, it's really, it's really, honestly really quite disappointing. I am a, you know, a leftist and I try and I support um, um, the BCNDP generally, but in terms of this response to this, um, to this expert panel report, it was generally, uh, I don't want to say out of hand, they didn't dismiss it, but they did not ha have a very positive reaction to this report. And, but I believe that the report is correct. Uh, they are focusing in on many of these very inequitable faucets of our current housing system and suggesting improvements, but it is very difficult to get these passed. Um, they won't have necessarily broad public, uh, public support, for, especially of wealthier people. And so it is relatively difficult to get political support um, behind these recommendations. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, Nathan, do you wanna weigh on this briefly? <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that there were a lot of great uh, um, uh, recommendations that came out of the report. I know the uh, expert panel uh, really tried, you know, to, to figure out how do we fix things. Um, and so far, yes, I think the, the taxation uh, proposals were dismissed pretty quickly, but uh, let's keep kicking those around and uh, uh, keep support for those up there because uh, we know that's, that's definitely a way we want to move forward. Um, uh, just a couple of other quick things that I know have, have come up. Uh, um, as Jennifer mentioned, the uh, sort of history of zoning, and I think Luna mentioned this as well in terms of the chat earlier on, um, as, as premised in this sort of uh, racist segregation thing, I just wanted to give a shout out to Stephanie Allen's uh, master's thesis, which really touched on this issue, and Harlan Bartholomew's history as a planner who came and really influenced Vancouver's plan, and of course started in St. Louis with influencing segregation that's what he was doing in terms of zoning and brought that uh, uh impulse here as well um and uh that's uh so that really is behind this was was keeping rental housing in particular sort of uh, apartment housing out of single family neighborhoods really was the impetus behind that that zoning decision um and i think that too is something that the expert panel is really suggesting uh you know trying to actually get at how do we get these these needs reports that municipalities are already supposed to file how do we actually link that up to um, getting them to do a better job of planning for a uh, future and planning for lots more housing? Um, and that's something that hopefully, again, I think New Zealand's one path to do that. We've got a California, it's another model to do that, but hopefully that's something that the um, uh, provincial government and ultimately the federal government with respect to infrastructure really start to tie in to how to also reform uh, municipalities and encourage better planning for Inclusiveness. Thanks, Nathan. And uh, yeah, certainly there's a link there to uh, Stephanie's uh, thesis. I encourage everyone to take a look at that. It really, um, we can't really know where we're going and how to change it. We don't actually know what our past is. And I think Stephanie has done a great job of, you know, giving us the data to actually understand uh, how we can do things differently. Um, the, we're, we're about nine minutes to seven, so I want to keep everybody, but we do have one last question for all the panelists, and if you can just um, do it maybe within one minute or so, and then we're kind of going to, to thank yous and everything else. Um, our last question to all of you is, you know, what is your ideal housing vision for the city of Vancouver? And how do you think we, you know, how would you want to, to get there? How do we get there? Uh, so we just kind of want to end with your vision um, as uh, really experts and um, folks that have really studied this, uh, this issue. And uh, we would just kind of like to see here uh, what your ideal vision, housing vision for the city of Vancouver is. And I'm wondering maybe Jennifer, if you'd like to start. So um, I would love to have a extremely strong uh, presence uh, by the MST First Nations, um, in particular in the city of Vancouver. Um, I would love for them to be building as many Sinaks as they want in the Jericho lands and in, in, in Sinak. I would love to have them to, to return much more land to them. And what and of course, they are, it's absolutely 100% up to them on what they do with their land. It is their sovereign land. Um, what they have historically been doing is building housing. And I think that is an amazing, it's a, it's honestly, I think it's a gift to, it's a, it's, it's amazing for us um, to be able to continue to live on this land. They are being very welcoming by building more housing, I think, and it is, um, an inc inc it's, it's incredibly generous on their part, I think. Um, 
I believe that, uh, as I alluded to, I would love to see the, the non-profit um, housing sector be enlarged and be empowered to build as much housing as possible. Um, again, social uh, housing that is secure um, for the, the, the lowest income folks that the market will never um, will, will not uh, build for. I think they absolutely, of course, as ha they deserve uh, secure housing as well. So I would love to have that um, enlarged. I would love to have much more equitable access. Again, mar my renters that can afford market rents like myself, um, I would love more options for uh, us. I want so many options that landlords are begging for renters to come. This is actually uh, literally the case in, Tor in Tokyo where I grew up, um, where there are so, so many smaller apartment buildings literally everywhere. And yeah, I mean, there is high vacancy rates. I think vacancy rates are about 1% uh, here, hovering around 1% versus in Tokyo, it's like 10%. There, is, there are so many options everywhere. And it's, it's and yes, and therefore the rent to income ratio is so much lower and, and houselessness rates, um, ha, ha, the homelessness rates are about a hundredth of the, the rate here. So it's like 0 0.3 people per uh, homeless people per 10,000 people in Japan versus it's, it's something like 37 homeless people per 10,000 here. So it's just incomparably high here, and that's it. I don't. It's very rare to see homeless people on the streets in, in Japan. Here, it's just it's heartbreaking. So um, yeah, I would say no homelessness. I want landlords begging for tenants and and tons and tons of of housing and buying for indigenous people and, and non market housing. Thank you, Jennifer. I think that's a that's a great vision that lots of people, I'm sure, would be able to buy into, uh, myself included. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, uh, Jens uh, next if you can share your vision with us, and I'll have Nathan wrap up for us uh, with yours. Yeah, I want to um, let me try and make it short. So maybe um, really this inclusive city um, idea where we have enough chairs, I think, is sort of really important and central to this and that of course well that must include also enough reserve chairs for those that um, the market um, can't or won't serve so this is something that really i think needs to be central i would like to have a more regional view we're somewhat balkanized here in vancouver um, people don't think of Boundary Road as being um, the hard boundary that it is in terms of planning policy. Um, I was just at, at a friend's, um, fortunately a friend's rooftop deck overlooking um, toward the east and you could tell where Boundary Road is just by um, where some of the towers start. <laughs> It's really uh, quite striking and, and you can look at it if you look at data, you can tell these, these boundaries like um, boundary road, you can tell it in say census data, pretty much any data set you look at. And so I want a more regional uh, view that, that combines this and, and furthers a regional vision. In terms of form, what would that look like? Um, I'm from Europe, I like the sort of six story throughout style, but I'm not very particular on that. I think what's much more important to me is, is this, this idea of enough chairs and um, ability of anybody to actually access them. So that also means enough reserve chairs. Thanks, Jens. That's a, uh, yeah, no, that's uh, pretty interesting as well to, to have the different, different types of forms of housing as well as different affordability levels of housing as well. Nathan, your last word um, over to you on your ideal vision of housing. Uh, Great. Um, I like both Jennifer's and Jens's ideal visions. I'm happy to live in those cities. Um, and I do think that, yeah, I think that uh, um, having lots of chairs is really key. The other thing that I think um, I would just keep emphasizing, right, is that it shouldn't ever, of course, just be my vision or any one of our visions. Um, we are in a city, we've got lots of visions and that diversity is also something I really wanna see. I wanna live in a diverse city where there's lots of different kinds of places that people are living, lots of different lifestyles people are living. Um, that's what I love about uh, uh, cities is, is this diversity of things that I haven't even thought of that people might be doing and, and, and how they might be living. So I wanna try and uh, move us toward a city that embraces that instead of constraining it and shutting it down all the time, which is so much of what uh, we, we often tend to do in terms of how our regulatory systems works. So step into that uh, diversity and make it really inclusive. And that's where I wanna be living. Well, thank you, Nathan. I think that's a really great way to sum up this discussion. We've heard, um, you know, we just want to thank Jennifer, Nathan, Jens for 
um, providing their perspective and, and really digging down into some details uh, that can really help us kind of broaden our thinking about how do we build more housing in the city of Vancouver. And to that, that would equate to a more equitable and inclusive city as well. It's not just about building the bricks and mortar. There is a social um, aspect to providing housing, especially we look at housing as a human right. So no, I just wanna thank you very much uh, for your contributions. Thank you um, for the, the folks that sent in your aunt, uh, your questions and sorry we weren't able to get to uh, all of them. Uh, there were very, uh, there was quite a few. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you to the panelists and I also wanna thank the BCPC for having me as a moderator. I had a great time and uh, I'm gonna pass it back over to Albert uh, to finish up. Well, thank you very much, Lillian. Um, I, I, I can say uh, you've done a master, masterful job of kind of hurting our panelists, uh, as it were, and uh, kind of bringing together uh, what I thought and I hope, hope our, our participants here have found to be uh, a really informative discussion. Um, I think a bit of my takeaway was to think of the city, uh, this region, not just Vancouver as, of, as an island, but to think of um, our region is not just a static place and that if, if uh, coming away from this talk that any of our attendees here, <clears throat> uh, fellow Vancouverites here have any thoughts on their vision for the city, what they hope to see that um, I would encourage them to write and encourage their mayor and council, whether it's Vancouver's mayor and council or, or otherwise uh, to, 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 to let them know, um, you know, what sort of inclusive housing future, what sort of secure housing future uh, you, you need uh, those councils and those uh, city staff to write policy for. It, it doesn't happen overnight and um, democracy is a participatory exercise and I, I think it demands that of, of each and every one of us. Um, so, so to wrap up, I just wanted to uh, just share the VCPC side of it uh, being uh, that um, we hope uh, everyone that's attending tonight will keep up with future VCPC uh, activities and events like this. Um, clearly, as uh, Yuri's mentioned, uh, there'll be uh, follow-up discussions to delve into uh, a lot of, uh, of important, uh, if not more important, uh, topics related to planning and housing. Uh, I saw questions about accessibility, uh, how affordability is delivered, uh, questions about uh, how, you know, extremely sad and topical just the, the current uh, weather patterns and, and what that might imply for, for housing. Um, so there's a lot of avenues for uh, my fellow commissioners to, to consider for a follow-up event. Um, so again, thank you all for joining tonight. We, we hope that you found the discussion stimulating. Um, we'll leave you with a few ideas to consider to chat about with your fa uh, family, friends, and fellow neighbors. Uh, and more importantly, I also want to thank, in addition to Lillian moderating the event, uh, Yuri uh, Artebis, uh, who's our executive director, who's done a fantastic job of uh, bringing this event together and keeping it uh, moving so well. Uh, for folks that asked at the start of uh, this evening, uh, there are transcripts and recording of today's webinar that was made uh, along with a presentation deck once we confirm permission from our panelists that will uh, post to vancouverplanning.ca. Uh, we expect to have those up within about a week or, or so. Um, uh, the Vancouver City Planning Commission will be reviewing the transcripts for some key points in the discussion as well as the questions that uh, attendees put in and will inform our work uh, going forward. Uh, and we'll also look to use some of that information to share it with city staff as well as Vancouver uh, uh, mayor and council, perhaps, along with um, Vancouver City staff that are working on the current Vancouver plan exercise. Um, so, thank you again for attending, and um, we, we hope you've, uh, uh, you know, you have done anything with your evening uh, today, but we're very appreciative that you took the time to join uh, ourselves and this panel. Have a great night, and take care, everyone.